All right, so let's go over the answers first. So cordyceps. Fungus. Yep, parasitic fungus. That's one that you know, controls insects' brains and makes like ants climb things and hold on to death grip, and then after they're dead, fungus grows out of the ant and spreads. It's awesome. It's awesome. Um, okay, so what that shows, you know, <coughs> parasitism, talk about disease evolution, dispersal, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, silver sword. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, they're, const they're confined to Hawaii, so I guess, but rare that way. Yep. Good. What else about them? Adaptive, Adaptive radiation, right? So this weedy little plant in California, the California tarweed, got into Hawaii, and it was like, ooh, there's nothing here. And <coughs> has massive radiation where they have ones that are small alpine plants, large tree-like forms, big spiky things. It's a really cool example of an adaptive radiation. Is that also a rapid dispersal? Yeah, it is pretty rapid. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, the, the, among yeah, I mean, so these, are these people have like gone through various groups and figured out the diversification rate. There's a pretty high diversification rate. There are things that are faster. It's so, like drift lake cichlids are faster than that. So, that was pretty fast. Pretty fast. Um, ground sloth. So these large things that would eat large fruits and dig up things from the ground and have giant claws. They actually walk on the sides of their feet rather than the bottom of their feet. And actually, now we've, we've, people have gotten um, plant fossils from <clears throat> their copper lights. Yeah. Yep. And then died. Um, Demetrodon. Not a dinosaur. Good. Yes. Like everything you learned growing up. What is it then? Is it a plant? Yeah, it's one of those mammal-like reptiles, right? It's really, it's really it's what they really became mammals. Yep. And it happens when it had a big <coughs> sail on the back. Remember this? Okay. Oopnera. One person said unicorn. Uh, <laughs> it's a narwhal. Bacteria, right? What do they do? They're aphids, right? They're just amount of aphids. So imagine if you spent all your life eating nothing but maple syrup, right? And very, very um, uh, weak maple syrup. Right? And that's what an aphid's life is, right? Six peroxys into plant, sucks up phloem, okay, which is mostly sugar. So where does it get amino acids and things like that? Well, it has symbionts that make these for it. So that's, so that's a premier case of that. It's been really well studied. Okay. Any questions? <coughs> All right. So any questions about the presentations? So I sent out an email last night. Did everyone get that? No. Okay. I'll send it again. Um, <coughs> basically, everyone should have your, your, your presentations ready to go on Friday, and then give them all to me, and then I'll pick it at random. And that way, you don't have, if you're one of the groups that goes on Wednesday, you don't have an extra, you know, week to get it prepared, but it's also fair for everyone. Um, the exceptions for that is if you know you're going to be out someday, um, let me know, and you can make sure you're, sure you're, not, you're not scheduled on that day. Okay. Um, again, it should be a research project, sort of scaled for a grad student, so 20, 10 to 20 K for the funds. So don't, you know, build a giant tank to study sperm whale breeding or something. I mean, it should be reasonable. <coughs> um, I don't need, so you, you, you need to describe the methods such that we can see that, okay, this is a feasible project. You don't need to go into such detail you say, I'm going to use this program version 51, um, sort of general. I'm going to study, you know, DNA evolution in Brunera by sequencing the genome and comparing it to genomes of free living things and do this sort of test. Okay, that makes sense? Aim for 10 minutes. Okay. Those who aren't presenting will be evaluating you. Um, 
the scores will be based on my evaluations. We also want people to be engaged and evaluate too, and so this will count as quizzes. Okay. Um, any questions about this? Okay. PowerPoint's okay. PDF's okay. Um, if you're going to use an uh, open office, something like that, let me know. That's also okay. If you're using LaTeX, convert to PDF for me, please. Okay. Good. All right. So, learning outcomes for today. So, one goal for this class is to make sure you actually start to think. All right. So, rather than just being passive you know, repositories of, of information, to actually be able to engage in scientific debates. So, bring evidence to bear. Think about what, how you could test certain things. Okay. So, today we're going to see how well you've done with that. All right. So, it'll be a series of class discussions. So we'll have these discussion prompts, and then we'll have to, you can talk to your pairs, and then we can talk together about this. Okay? And I want everyone to be engaged. Okay? So, <coughs> what matters more in macroevolution? Differential speciation, some species speciate faster than others, or differential extinction, some go extinct faster than others. Okay, so think about what the answer is, or if you don't know, how you could test that. Okay? And so talk to your partners about that, and then we can talk as a group about that. All right, so what's the answer? What you're thinking about this? So you're saying that you think they're about equal in, in any cases, big error bars you can't tell. Okay, another cool thing about that. I think, yeah. I think distinction is kind of more of a, a specific case. Um, generally, I think like a change in the environment um, or in the biotic or abiotic environment cause extinctions, whereas you could get, that could also cause speciation, you can also get speciation from dispersal into other environments, mm -hmm. and, um, and just, like, species evolving to take advantage of new resources. Mm -hmm. um, and then through evolutionary time, you see periods where there's mass extinction events, but in general, you see uh, species increasing diversity. Okay. So for that, you'd argue that speciation matters more? Yeah. Okay. Are you saying that, like, 
reversal is only a tactical situation, not a sanction? There, I mean, you, you have, I guess you have competition. You could have a, a weak competitor moving into an area of the market cause local competition. But, but I think in general, <coughs> you could say, like, a barrier for a dispersal could cause a dispersal. Discussing like that's good. What do you say? You may not criticize the question. All right, <laughs> let, let me clarify the question then. Um, in terms of explaining modern diversity, or in, uh, like both, both in terms of phenotypic diversity and species diversity, which of these processes has a bigger influence, right? So if we could hold, if we could take out one, which would, you know, if you're doing a regression or something, which would have a bigger role, yeah. It's, it's good to clarify that, yeah. If you're a pessimist, you like extinction. If you're an optimist. <laughs> How, how does speciation open niches? Oh, see, okay. Well, I mean, 99% of species are extinct and 100% speciated. So it's slightly more speciation and extinction currently. At some point, it's equal. That's what matters with diversification is the difference between them. Yep. Which has which is more selective? So is speciation random with respect to, with respect to traits, or is extinction random with respect to traits, or both? <coughs> Neither. So there's that kind of extinction where you know if you're the Yucatan, too bad, right? Okay, I love the Yeah, that's a good question. What proportion of extinctions come from sort of background extinction processes versus, you know, those that die just at, you know, the big five or you know, the big six mass extinctions? Yeah. Can mass, ex mass extinctions be selective, though? <laughs>
Would people agree with that? Oh, so in terms of driving towards, um, so extinction is more selective, like, you know, selection, selection for dealing with oxygen. So in terms of, dis of um, evolving towards a monoclear trait, extinction plays a bigger role than selection, than a speciation. What do people think? What about specialization of pollinators <coughs> and flowers? So they're sort of selected for a good match between a pollinator and a, poll and a flower, right, which might lead to a higher speciation rate. And more easily get get lack of gene flow. Exclusion takes more time or less time? It depends. So yeah. Have yeah. Yeah, so we said so extinction and speciation have different time frames. So extinction might take longer than speciation would. And actually, it's not something people think about much, but it could be relevant. In some speciation, like L polyploidization, where you combine you know, two different plants and get something that has twice the number of chromosomes. That can happen like that, right? So you have a new species descended from two parents. But some speciation, you have two distinct populations that gradually change. That could take a lot longer. So that could have an effect. Good. All right. How would life evolve if there were no mass extinctions? I see, like, you know, big five mass extinctions. Five versus zero is not a very big difference. So how how would life be different? So yeah, talk 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 each other first, and then you can. Talk with your... Yeah. All right, what do people think? So, yeah. Um, you said that extinctions would still be And then you're making a distinction between like externally driven species like extinction and extinction caused by additional other species. And it's good to think about both. Yeah. Okay, so this still would be extinction. How would traits change or how would diversity change? Slower?
Mm-hmm. That's your hypothesis that the evolutionary rate depends on availability of open niches. Okay? People agree with that? <coughs> How would we show he's right or wrong? How do we show that niche availability results in faster diversification rates or faster trade evolution rates? Exactly. Yeah. Always the correct answer. Um, not always. You guys, so you could simulate a faster rate of evolution after, but then how do you show that your simulation is right? Well, you, you could show that you could, you could show that you predict what you see better using that predict that that simulation than a model that's a constant rate simulation. So that would be high. so you could do some missions get out of that actually. Okay, what else were people thinking about this question? Yeah. So the idea that generalists go ex go extinct more slowly than, spe than specialists tend to do at mass extinctions, um, and so they have more specialization. And the question I would have is, do you have also a higher extinction rate of specialists when you don't have mass extinctions? I'm not sure. Right, but but how about in the, the background background extinction? Do we have to cause <coughs> Faster extinction rate as well, or would it be the same? Yeah, how, how could we show that? Mm -hmm. Do we do you know, have any examples? Yeah. No, that's like it's, specialized um, <coughs> relationships. Yeah, so if you have a big dust cloud covering the earth, things that are sort of general and can do photosynthesis or not might not do as well as those that are really well optimized for doing chemosynthesis and they can survive at the high vents. Yeah, that could happen. How about the question about different extinction rates for specialists and <coughs> mass extinctions versus background times? Could you check that? Sure. Yeah, so specialist generalist is one axis of variation. We also have you know, symbiotic, not symbiotic. 
And so if you have specialist tendon-based symbiotic more, then you don't know if what's driving extinction is symbiosis or specialization. So you're decoupling those factors. <coughs> As far as the test, one thing you could do <coughs> is here's your tree. You have background time mostly, and then you have a few mass extinction times. And so you could see if, you know, here the birth rate and death rate of specialists, of, uh, if the death rate of specialists is greater than that for journalists here, and then do the same different model here, and the same models here, down here. Right, so you can that, use that heterogeneity to see um, <coughs> do we have this rate changing over time. Good. Okay. How would just raw number of species, how would that change uh, have been uh, mass extinctions? So, you know, so we have between 1.5 million and 10 million species around right now. Okay. Um, how would that change if there had been no mass extinctions? Right, so I'm thinking about the ecology of it, right? And so does presence or absence of a top predator increase or decrease diversity lower down? So if you think that mass extinctions tend to knock out top predators, that might mean that, you know, you have more individual herbivores and so more species. What would people think about this? Mm-hmm. Yep. So, oh, oh. I mean, even with, I mean, so if, you know, we can rerun life with mass extinction and get you know, this distribution of, you know, so I can go from, you know, a thousand species to a hundred million, right? If I have a system to simulate it, if I were to do it with, um, without mass extinction, it could be this, or it could be this, or it could be that. So it's good. So I mean, it's one thing we don't deal don't do well is in biology in general is deal with variation, and that's why Darwin was so cool because he looked at species and saw, oh, there's variation within species. Oh, some can do better than others. Variation, natural selection. So that's what we do with the rocks, right? So here, I mean, yes, there is variation. It's good to think about that. But then, how about the mean of these distributions? What limits the number of species now? Oh, well, yeah, us, true. <laughs> Before us, what limit the number of species? Resource availability? Mm -hmm. So there's a certain, certain amount of body mass you can have, right? But take the bison of the Great Plains, right? When there used to be millions of bison. So I could have had 20 bison species, I could have had one bison species, and, eat, and either of them would have still have millions of, millions of individuals. Right. So well, what would limit that factor? So the same number of bodies, but let's put them to different species or one species. Okay, how's that? Yep. 
as a speciation is largely allopatric, and things that can disperse well, even though they have huge numbers, might not speciate. Um, one current debate in my area of biology is whether diversification um, <coughs> is logistic or exponential. Right, so, ecology, what's, what, what's logistic growth? Yes, curve. Yep, yes, curve. Right. And you get up to this <coughs> line up here. What's this line up here? K. Yep, carrying capacity. Right? And so some people will think, look in biology and say, all right, if you could just increase exponentially, what you should see is over time, older clades have more species. Because uh, they have more time to diversify. Other people say that older clades, younger clades, they each have their own K. There should be no correlation there. Okay. And looking across many clades, we find there's no correlation. So they argue then that there's certain carrying capacity. How does that relate that really played to this question? <coughs> it was exponential to be a ton more species. Right? Yeah. So, right, so if it were exponential, then without these mass diebacks, we'd have one more time for things to expand and more species. If it's logistic, you know, you get knocked back and then go back up, back to K again. Another question. Have worms ever, ever escaped an evolutionary trade off? Right. So, first of all, why are trade offs important? Do you know? Yeah, why don't you just have incredible speed and produce thousands of cubs every year that are all well cared for and, you know, can escape all predators and perfectly camouflage? Well, there's trade-offs there. Like they have so much food, they can't have thousands of cubs and also have very nice chubby fat cubs. You could have thousands of offspring, like a cod, and have little tiny ones, or have a few. So, how welcome to ever escape an evolutionary trade-off? Talk to each other about it. All right. So, can people think of any examples of this? The evolution trade off things have escaped. <coughs> or can it not happen? Mm 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So everyone hear that? So rotor, for example, where you have this cost of being asexual and you lose variation, um, but they get around that by uptake of just random stuff from the environment. Um, and so they have both, they've skipped the trade-off of, you know, if you have sex, you pass on half your genes. They pass on all their genes, but still allow, allow themselves to get variation. <coughs> what else? I definitely think people have human genes. Because um, we can live in any sort of environment nowadays that we aren't adapted to because we have the tools like clothes and stuff. And Technically, I could go fly halfway across the world and then find someone and have children with them, which mm -hmm. is not possible. Or like, if I were to just like jog. So, mm -hmm. with technology, I think we've sort of escaped some trade-offs. Okay. You want to comment on that? But I mean, what, about the, what about the human example? Do humans not count? I mean, when I think of trade-offs, think of something like, um, you have something like um, bite speed and crushing ability in fish, say, so you need to like, get your food very easily, very quickly, or you can crunch through it, right? And so this is a trade-off where you can have, you know, jaws that open quickly with a lot of force, or jaws that close slowly, but are very strong, right? But there are fish that have escaped this by, you know, having one set of jaws adapted to fast capture, another set of jaws in the throat adapted to crushing. And so they've escaped this trade-off by allowing themselves to do both. So that's what I would mean by a trade-off. Yeah. Yep. How so? Mm -hmm. <coughs> right, so yeah, so like things like crocodilians, the teeth are all the same type, right? But mammals are cool. We have molars for crushing, we have incisors for biting off things. Yep. So we don't have to have one tooth type of them specialized. Yeah. <coughs> Well, so the fish that are on this line have two sets of jaws, but they're still correlated. Whereas offline, they're not correlated anymore. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good 
but but right, there could be cases where it seems like a trade off. Like you've escaped a trade off, but it's by taking someone from, from somewhere else. It's all connected. Yeah. Six, six cichlids, yeah. Yeah, one out of twenty of every vertebrate is a cichlid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Now, let me go to the pet store, give them some respect. All right, so we'll meet on, fr on Friday. You can email me your presentations earlier, that'd be nice, but you can also just bring it in Friday morning.